Susan, thank you so much for joining us and being willing to be our first person today. Uh, we are excited about having you with us, and I know you have so much to share with us in a, in a very short period, so we'll, we'll get started if that's okay with you. Thank right. you very much for having me. This is a real honor. Thank, thank you, you, Susan. Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933, the year before your birth. Before you tell us about what you and your family went through during the Holocaust and World War II, tell us about your family and you in your early years before the war began. I know you were very young, but from what you know, tell us a little bit about your family and their circumstances. Well, uh, you all have seen that silly little picture on the tricycle. Uh, we lived at that time in Pest. Uh, Budapest are really two cities, Buda being an ancient one, Pest a more modern one, although old enough to see the crumbling uh, corridors that uh, my bicycle, I rode my bicycle on. But pretty soon, we moved over to Buda. Um, within a, half a year of that picture, because my father had emphysema and, um, from a young age, and uh, he needed the fresh air of Buddha. And that was wonderful for me, because I just roamed the hills. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. Um, we lived in a flat, uh, in a two-story villa. Um, I thought it was a palace, uh, and bright and beautiful, it had a balcony. And I have very fond memories of that for the first couple of years. But I was an only child and pretty much alone, except for the two cousins who moved to England in 1939. So I didn't have too much um, chance to enjoy them. Um, I was an only child and pretty spoiled, spoiled rotten. I was the apple of my parents' eyes, and I was very fortunate to have very bright, uh, loving, nurturing uh, background. Susan, tell, uh, tell us a little bit about your father. He had a successful dental practice, but he was also a prominent man, and, and, and as you put it to me, for the time, very broad-minded. Well, um, we were so-called emancipated Jews, which meant my father was basically an agnostic, but with a strong Jewish identity. Um, so we um, grew up, I grew up, uh, learning about the whole world, not just the small country I was in. He traveled widely, very widely, really, in Western Europe. Uh, just before the war broke out, and I heard lots of stories. Um, he in, told me tales of uh, Greek mythology and as well as the Old Testament and the New Testament and geography. I remember him showing me the map when I was maybe five or six. Uh, I knew geography because those were the places where he told me I would be able to see eventually. Um, he was also a social activist, uh, today we would call it, a prominent member of the Social Democratic Party in Hungary uh, at the time, which was a very um, progressive party. Not the communist, this is important in view of what happens later mm -hmm. after the war, um, but uh, he was well known, well connected, even as a Jew, um, which was unusual at the mm -hmm. time. And um, he was also the president of the uh, Dental uh, Technician National Association. So he, he really had leadership, uh, strong leadership ability. And how about your mother, Margaret? Tell us just a little bit about her. Well, my mother, as you saw, uh, was really beautiful, I think and uh, very loving, very nurturing in her good moments, but uh, he, she also had bad moments. She, had, she suffered from anxiety for good reasons uh, most of her life. Um, she lost her mother when she was uh, maybe 15, 14 or 15, and an older sister, the only sister she had died very young as well. So she was basically uh, not willfully, but was abandoned by her father who remarried, a pretty crazy woman in 
um, uh, she was kind of drifting around, uh, being taken care of her cousins, uh, once removed, which included my father, by the way. She was 18 years younger, and uh, eventually, when my father was 40, they discovered that uh, they didn't just have a mentorship relationship, but they were in love with each other. And it was a long and happy marriage. Before we turn to the war itself, um, as we mentioned at the beginning, your uncle Laszlo moved with his yeah. family and your two cousins. Tell us a little bit more about his attempts to get your father to go and, wh and why your father didn't take him up on that opportunity. Well, <laughs> bright as my father was, intelligent as he was, he was an idealist. And he was, like so many people in Hungary, uh, the intelligentsia, was convinced that was what was happening, the rest of the world would never happen in Hungary. Evil was so extreme that it was incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't see uh, the flood coming. I call it the flood. Uh, and he really thought that the war will end in no time at all, the Allies will be victorious, and uh, everything will go back to normal. And so he didn't leave. Right. And of course, the war began with Germany's invasion of Poland, September 1st, 1939. Um, tell us what you can about what it was like for your family and you in those first several years of the war. Well, that was how. Um, so when the war broke out, uh, my father and the rest of the several hundred, 600,000 uh, Jews uh, in Hungary were, of course, trapped. There was nowhere to go. Um, I was, uh, I went to school first grade early. Maybe I was not quite five. And in the very beginning, I went to an embassy school, uh, so I learned English as well as mm -hmm. Hungarian. But of course, after the war broke out, that was shut down. And I had to repeat the grade uh, in a public school. At that point, I was for the first time directly experiencing anti-Semitism. Um, kids I had been playing with started calling me dirty Jew and refused to play with me, or those who wanted to play with me, were not allowed to play with me. And I was completely confused. I mean, I had a lot of self-confidence uh, because I was a cherished child, and I just could not understand what was happening. Uh, I thought it was bizarre, and um, I don't know whether mm -hmm. I should speak more. But one of the seminal uh, confusion was about the dirty Jew business. That I was a very clean child. My mother was <laughs> always insisted that I wash uh, extremely thoroughly, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was much cleaner than most of, my, <laughs> most of the kids who called me dirty Jew. So I was confused and went to my father. And uh, for explanation, he was a very rational man most of the time. And um, he explained to me that this was a metaphor. And it was, uh, of course, I didn't know what the metaphor was. Um, and in a way, I remember that to this day, because from then on, I never took anything literally, um, but tried to find some kind of meaning um, behind it. However, it was still devastating because I became a parent. So. Tell us about the, the distant relatives of yours who came to your home from Transylvania, which their visit caused you, what you described to me as this sense of foreboding. Will you say a little about that? Well, you know, um, when you're a child, your uh, mind uh, processes things differently. So even though things were difficult, and I saw the headlines in the newspapers and the newsreels in the movie houses, and uh, was subjected to quite a bit of discrimination and abuse. It was real, but it wasn't fully real. Um, and then one day, um, some people I never met um, in traditional garb from Transylvania, um, which is now Romania, um, came for dinner, Sunday dinner. And there were five or six people, adults, uh, about three generations. And I overheard 
because I was allowed to roam around freely, you know. Um, horrible tales of murder, pogroms, uh, concentration camps, which was totally unknown to me. And I don't think that I understood much of it, but that's when I, for the first time, experienced something terrible. Mm -hmm. Something was terribly wrong. Something was terribly dangerous. And I was so upset, I had to leave the table. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's when my real trauma began. You know, I was about five or six. You know. Five or six. Yeah. You described to me also that uh, from where you lived in Buddha, um, you had a balcony, and your father brought you out on the balcony to watch the, the bombings were beginning. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that was interesting. You know, the Allies started bombing actually quite early. It didn't become um, severe until, I think, uh, um, certainly by 1943 and 44, but this may have been around 1941, mm -hmm. 1942. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at that time, uh, the air raids would be directed towards industrial targets and railroads, uh, tactical bombing. And um, from our vantage point from the hill, we were still in Buddha, um, you could uh, had a fantastic view of Pest, of the other side of the river and the outskirts of town. And so um, <laughs> my father called me up to the balcony from my favorite cherry tree, but I had a tree out, um, to witness uh, some of their battles. And uh, it was so vivid, you know, these red um, uh, trajectories, uh, uh, surrounding the place and occasionally uh, the planes plunging. And I couldn't tell whether it was the good planes or the bad planes, but it was Nazi planes or Allied planes. My father seemed to know. And he was so excited. He said, you see, the war will be over in no time. The Allies will win. We are good. That'll be good. One of the other things that, um, uh, uh, that you shared was, because Hungary, of course, was an ally of Germany and Hungarian troops were on the fighting against the Russians on the Eastern Front, you, you had to knit socks and socks. <laughs> you remember that. I do, T yeah. tell us about that. Uh, well, that's kind of a weird episode. Uh, for the one more year that I was allowed to go to school because after that, uh, Jews couldn't go to school. Right. We were put in Jewish houses and later ghettos. So uh, I went to this public school, right? And one of the projects in the school in wartime was to support the troops, right? We do that too. Um, and the way <laughs> in elementary school uh, we were supposed to support the troops was to knit, uh, it would, of course the Hungarians were sent to the Siberian Russian front. Right. The Germans <laughs> didn't want to kill their own. Um, so uh, we were, uh, the kids were supposed to knit uh, warm scarves and warm socks and leg warmers. And I wasn't a good knitter anyway, but I was forced to do this and I was so conflicted. I really didn't want to support the troops, right? Because uh, they were on the wrong side. On the other hand, they were the parents and uh, brothers of people I knew and, and, and cared for and loved. So it was a big dilemma. Do I refuse to knit, uh, which I couldn't anyway, but pretend I can't knit, or do I knit? And <laughs> for my child's mind, the solution lay in, okay, I knit, but it's going to be very ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so I dropped so many, as many stitches as I know how. So yeah, but that tells you about my character a little bit, at least early on, yeah. Um. Susan, at, at some point, you and your family were forced to leave your home in the Buddha part of Budapest and move to Pest. Where were you forced to move, and, and what did that mean? What did that move mean for you and your family? Okay, I'll, I'll be brief about it. We didn't actually move. You know, you were essentially expelled. Expelled. Uh, your, uh, it was from one day to another. I mean, there was no preparation, so you had to leave everything behind. 
um, and move into one of the designated Jewish houses. This was the immediate precursor of the ghetto, and in fact, uh, the house, uh, if he moved in, but at that point at least you could choose where you mm -hmm. move. You could uh, choose which of the Jewish houses you moved in. Yeah, and yeah. the Jewish house meant that only Jews uh, could live right. there. Uh, they had to triple and quadruple and quintuple up in apartments that were previously occupied with maybe a couple. Um, in, which, uh, in our case, it was actually my uncle who lived at the edge of what became later the ghetto, literally one uh, street beyond the ghetto, what was become later the ghetto. So we packed a suitcase each and I was told to uh, pick my favorite book and toy, uh, which I did. And, you know, some, like an overnight suitcase, you know. And uh, off we went. Uh, there was no time. Right. Uh, there was no time. And in the Jewish house, uh, the crowding, it became even worse later. Uh, it was difficult to imagine. It, what it, uh, the apartment had one, one kitchen, of course, one bathroom, and a toilet, a half bath. Um, and most of the time, there were at least uh, 10, 12 of us there, but people were coming and going. Mm -hmm. um, Jews were fleeing the persecution in the country, which uh, was always a couple of steps ahead from Budapest, would uh, take shelter there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that time that we were ordered to wear the Jewish star on all outward clothing. You couldn't go out, well, first of all, we had curfew, so there were only three hours during the day that we could uh, leave the house. Um, it was an apartment building, very old, crumbling. Um, and only with a Jewish star uh, on our coats or jackets or whatever it was. It was pretty humiliating. And it was a big yellow star. Yeah. And, and are, you shared with me that, that you, you had to cut them out yourself. Oh, my mother did. Your mother did that. Yeah. Your mother did and that. And if you didn't wear it, uh, and again, it was overnight yeah, that this yeah. came out, then you were arrested and never to be seen again. So. And, and along with the wearing the yellow star, many other restrictions were imposed on you. Curfews were set. Um, that affected your ability to get food. So. How were you able to eat during that time? <laughs> Not very well, I must yep. say. Um, well, uh, various ways. During the three, day, three hours when we were allowed to be out, now mind you, at this point, food became scarce for the whole city. Uh, so by the time we were allowed to be out, uh, there was very little left. Uh, so uh, food became very scarce. Um, it was somewhat supplemented, so we weren't starving yet. Mm -hmm. um, it was just scarce and uh, great shortages. Uh, you didn't have too much variety to eat. But we still had uh, enough to be on this side of starvation, on the good side. Um, because uh, friends, Gentile friends, um, would drop by surreptitiously so they are not seen uh, with care packages meaning food, um, there were many good people. There were many evil people, but there were many good people in, in the city. So while they could, they helped. I was, I'm gonna go back to when you were first forced out of Buddha. Um, I was struck when you, uh, by something you said. You, you remembered people coming and going because your parents were trying to save some of their possessions by giving them to people for safekeeping. Oh, well, everybody did that. When you were evicted, because basically that's yep. what it was, you were evicted from your normal home, and all you could take was a suitcase, right? Um, what do you do? Um, you leave it behind for the, you know, the fascists the, to have it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, so you gave away some, and then friends would volunteer to save it for you for when the war is over, which is around the corner. This couldn't last, you see. Right, right. Um, and so you see this dismantling. You got a child and see this dispersion and dismantling of people everything taking, you love. Yeah. People taking your furniture and going. And oh, yeah, not just furniture, but clothing, uh, oh, I don't know, knickknacks that you love, right, toys. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> I wanted to also ask you, um, 
Jewish men were forced to go into forced labor in labor battalions to support the war effort. This affected your father too. Well, yes, he was taken twice. Mm -hmm. And uh, miraculously, he was able to uh, somehow get out of it. Uh, I think through his connection, mm -hmm. um, but not, not, if, not immediately, right, but right. it took a while. And he was sent off at least twice before. Yeah. As, as terrible as, as, as it was for Jews in Hungary, it of course became far worse when Germany occupied Hungary in March of 1944. Tell us what you can about how things really changed for everybody, but for you and your family when that, when that happened. Well, it went from bad to worse, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, today we would call it a reign of terror became. Uh, to me, everything that happens up to that point was reign of terror, but mm -hmm. the true reign of terror started mm -hmm. at that point because there was a uh, government takeover. Uh, the then governor of Hungary, whose name was Horty, Miklos Horty, um, he collaborated with the Germans, but he maintained enough control so that the worst atrocities he would not allow, that is a mass murder. Mm -hmm. um, but when he was overthrown by the pro-Nazi uh, faction, uh, by the Arrow Cross Party, Nilos Party, um, which was the Hungarian Nazis, um, then he, uh, all hell broke loose for, uh, for Rio. And the deportation, the mass shootings on the streets, uh, in the apartments, uh, started so um, I don't know Keep. how much you want to hear about it. It's kind of pretty dismal, mm -hmm. um, but we were in fear all the time. And one one incident that that is just so powerful that you shared uh, was when you were able to go on an outing to Buddha um, when you were taken there. Will you tell us about that? Well, um, that's. An episode. Uh, I, I was shut up in that dingy old house, uh, and as you, I, I think, talked about it, uh, even today, I need to be outdoors. I need to be out in nature. So I was starved for sunshine and and uh, just getting out. And uh, at one point, uh, an old friend of my father and her boyfriend who happened to be a Wehrmacht officer, which means the German army. Uh, and not all Germans supported Hitler at that point, but didn't know how to get out. So he was one of those who um, wanted to do some good, I guess. Uh, so they came to visit us, which of course threw the house into absolute abject terror, because uh, here is a German officer. Right? In your house? Yeah. They didn't know who it was. Anyhow, they brought some food. And at some point, uh, because Libya was her name, uh, knew me, she said, do you, we'll take you out. Uh, we know how you love to be outdoors. And I jumped uh, to the opportunity. And uh, where do you want to go? And I wanted to go to my favorite, um, uh, well, Budapest is full with springs, hot springs, and one of them feeds, uh, well, several of them, uh, there are several of these, but there was a particular um, swimming pool uh, park uh, that I always went to as a child I was taken to, and I said I'd want to go to the gallery. It had a wave machine. And my mother, of course, didn't want to let me go because it was very dangerous. If, if they discover you again, you, you are gone, never to see daylight again or light. But in the end, they gave in, and so we went. And you, took the, you had to take your star off to oh, go. Of yeah. course, right, right. <laughs> because Jews were not allowed. Right. right. So anyhow, I had a great time for about maybe a full hour. Then I had this uh, terrible feeling of looming danger. Uh, I have no idea what took me off. Uh, so I asked to be taken home, which was very hard. But I guess my distress was so strong that um, they did follow suit. And we found out, of course, the next day 
that within 10 minutes of our departure, uh, the Nilos, you know, the Aerocross came uh, looking for everybody's papers, wanting to pick up a Jewish child. So, uh, yeah, that was my big adventure. I still remember it to this day. And your sense is that somebody recognized you and called the... Well, that, that's only yeah. a, a yep. truly explanation that right. somebody must have recognized me, called the, and called mm -hmm. the police. There's a Jewish child here, swimming and enjoying the sunshine. We can't have that, yeah. At some point, Susan, your family was abruptly forced out of the Jewish house that you were in with your uncle um, under just terrible circumstances. Describe what happened to you when you were forced out of that house. Well, I like the way you put it, forced. You know what they did, it's not forcing, a troop comes in, you know, kind of in helmets and machine guns or whatever they had at that time and says, out. Uh, and you can pack anything, you, you just have to go out. And you right. don't know where, you don't know whether you're going to be shot or taken to the concert or whatever. Anyhow, we, both, we were marched through town. And you had to, with your hands up, right? Yes. Uh, elderly, adults, children, with our hands held above our head. And if you dropped it, you were shot. So you didn't drop it. Um, this went on for a while and crowds surrounding you, some of them with compassion, many of them just grabbing whatever coat or jacket you had on or the gloves or whatever. Um, so this went on for about an hour and it was very traumatic to put it mildly. And then we were marched uh, into the big synagogue in uh, Budapest. Uh, uh, in Dohan Street, mm -hmm. and there, um, so we were, most, most of us were not shot, so uh, we were uh, packed in there uh, like sardines in a tin, and uh, you couldn't go to the bathroom, you didn't know what happened. Occasionally, they took out groups of us um, and um, uh, took them to the railroad station from where uh, they were uh, put in, uh, you know, the freight cars, mm -hmm that went to Auschwitz. So we knew this was just a question of time when it will be our turn. But after two days or so of no food and uh, uh, all kinds of other privations, you can imagine the hysteria of a crowd like this, everybody's the children, babies, uh, the old, the sick. Uh, suddenly we were let go. Uh, we were told, okay, that's it. And um, we first didn't believe it. We thought it's some kind of a trick and we'll be shot on our leaving, you know. But no, we were let go. So we marched back to the apartment, uh, the Jewish house, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we never knew what happened. And of course today I know that it was Wallenberg, or one of his men, who uh, was able to rescue the rest of us. Uh, from the deportation by bribing the Germans, uh, the Nazis. So that was a lucky escape. So we went back to the Jewish house, and I was, at that point, even my father realized that, okay, this is, uh, we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. um, because it was clear that from here on, uh, we will be killed one way or another, but also there would be the ghetto. And uh, he already, I think, I think he knew what was happening in Warsaw, but uh, of course I didn't. Uh, so he secured everybody who was able to would secure an affidavit from uh, one of the embassies who were willing to provide a protected house. A protected house meant that the Nazis were not supposed to enter it or take people away. And of course it was all actually an illusion because mm -hmm. most of these affidavits turned out to be forgeries later on. It, but it bought time because it took the Nazis a while to figure that out. So uh, we were bought some time to survive. Into what was called the, 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 under the protection of the Spanish, the Spanish house. You're right. There was a, one uh, Swiss uh, protected yeah. house. There were Swiss houses, which mm -hmm. turned out to be um, pretty useless uh, after very little time because people were uh, deported and taken out and shot from those. 
but the Swedish and Spanish houses had a bit more credibility, it seems, at least uh, for another month or two. So again, it bought us time. But even that, of course, uh, became neutralized and uh, we were sitting ducks because they knew where we were. And, and what were your cert conditions like in, in the Spanish house? <laughs> well, they were not good. Mm -hmm. uh, if we thought that the Jewish house was crowded, I mean, this was impossible. I mean, uh, people slept on the floor. Uh, I slept under a piano because I was small and fit. Um, that was the space you could find. Under yeah, the these were uh, nice modern apartments, actually, uh, by the Danube, occupied by, uh, you know, upper middle class folk uh, who were taken away. Uh, and um, so the furniture was still there, which made it even more crowded with, uh, oh, I don't know, there were at least 20 people in this two bedroom place, one kitchen, etc. So um, it was very crowded, but by this time, actually even in the Jewish house, uh, the Allied bombardments uh, intensified, greatly intensified. Uh, so uh, most people who could fit in would try to huddle in um, the cellar, uh, which doubled as air raid shelters because there were no air raid shelters and uh, the cellars were very cold, they were not finished, cold, was all over the place, that's what they used it for. So, it's very dark, of course, um, and no heat. By that time, there was no heat anywhere. The infrastructure was crumbling. So, it was difficult. But also, from the window, you could see, I could see, at times, the long row of people lined up by the Danube because this was, it's an L, uh, the street facing the Danube, uh, and we were in the foot of the L. So I had a great deal of vision. So people would be lined up there in the distance, and then they were gone, without actually leaving. So those were the people who were taken out of the protected houses, shot, and shoved in the to the river. Yeah. I was really um, both amazed and, um, and, 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 and sort of awed by, uh, awestruck by something you said about your father and some of the other men. I don't know if it was in the, in the Spanish house or the Jewish house, but with under constant danger, constant threat of Nazis or Aerocross entering, your father had this map on the wall uh, to track the Allied advances. Well, you know, the <laughs> It was a question of survival. I mean, um, we knew that we were all doomed uh, unless we are liberated, right, um, by the Allies. Um, and uh, we knew, uh, listening under threat of death uh, to Radio Free Europe and BBC, um, which were uh, all clandestine things, you know, I don't go into the details, but the men organized themselves. Uh, that was before we went to sleep. Um, and um, would have a hiding place where they would listen uh, at certain times to, to the news. So we knew the Allies were progressing and we knew they were near. Uh, and, and that had to be tracked. So that was one reason in this hiding place um, they would put up and father being a leader, you know, of course, a honcho, head honcho in this. Mm -hmm. um, they have the map with pinpoint, very much like Churchill's war room. Later on, when I visited it, I realized that's mm -hmm. what they were doing. Um, so that we knew what the progress was. Uh, and yes, they did that. And it also served as an early warning system um, when uh, the Nazis were approaching so that people could at least uh, hide or grab some food and put it in their pockets or whatever it was. So, uh, and we were couriers. Some of us kids uh, uh, offered to be couriers so that we could spread the word running around the building so others would be warned. Yeah. So that was the extent of their activism because that was all they that could was possibly could do. Done, yeah. yeah. As, as the Russians advanced, an intense siege of Budapest was underway. 
um, bombings and artillery, and you and your family, where you were located, you were absolutely in the midst of the siege of Budapest. Horrible period. Tell us what that was like. Well, I don't know if any of you had any battle experience, but it was like that. Um, because at first, there, uh, the area uh, bombardment was uh, so intense by that time that the siren, by the time the sirens came on, uh, the bombs were already falling. Uh, and in the end, they didn't even bother with the sirens because it was a, a constant uh, aerial attacks. But in addition to that, as uh, Hungary was uh, um, liberated by the uh, Russian army, Soviet army, so as they got into Budapest proper, uh, obviously the area attacks had to, in those days they couldn't be that precise, so that stopped. So the artillery, uh, Budapest was surrounded by artillery and the artillery fire uh, was constant and uh, demolishing actually most of the buildings. Even to this day, there are a few buildings that you don't see some bullet marks or some marks of that time. And now we are talking 50, 60 years. So uh, it, Hungary was in, Budapest was in, in rubble and going outside was uh, suicidal. And sometimes you had to do it to bring water. The men would go out and bring water from somewhere. Uh, and so they would, risk, they would risk all that, the artillery okay. fire, to get some water. Yeah. And, and speaking of risking going outside, earlier you said we were just on the other side of starvation. Now at this point, starvation is yeah. very real. Food is almost non-existent. And you left the building. Oh, yeah, that's not true. No, no, I mean, I, you should share that. Well, you know, I was a kid. I don't know how far I understood. I mean, I understood that we were all in mortal danger always, but, you know, you got tired of starving and not being able to do anything. So at one point, I, I uh, could sneak out around my mother, who kept eagle eyes on me, and, um, of course, without a star, and I knew where a nearby baker was. So. Uh, and we heard, had word that some, uh, they were able to, that night, they were able to bake some bread. Uh, and, and so I really wanted some bread and wanted to bring it home. So I snuck out, and there were long lines, of course, um, when we were not supposed to be outside at that point. But I was lucky enough, you know, I was dodging bullets and um, uh, had the privilege to do it again in 1956, but then I was an adult. Um, so um, I was able to get some bread and bring it home. And it was a great accomplishment because none of us saw bread, I think, by that time for at least a month. You, you, you referred to bread was, was like diamonds. I think that's the phrase you used. Oh, for. yeah. Bread was like diamonds. Well, it was, it was more precious than diamonds because well. you can starve to death and if you don't have diamonds, hey. So do you don't have diamonds. Yeah, and you, al you also said that, you know, first the potatoes were gone, then once the potatoes were gone, then there were some beans, and then the beans were gone. Oh, potatoes were great. That was back in the Jewish house. Yep. Yeah. And then, of course, the potatoes were gone. Uh, and then there were the beans, um, because high protein, right? So uh, not very nice diet. I hate beans. But at least it kept you alive. Then it was lentils. To this day, I cannot look at lentils. I know they're very healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the lentils were gone, and then it was really, really starvation. Um, yeah, and then water was gone, so even that was uh, very, very spare. It, it, it was hard. I mean, people went so far that, okay, so when you went outside, by that time, nobody went outside unless they absolutely had to, and there were dead bodies and dead horses lying around. And I remember once somebody brought home a piece of horse meat. And I remember that because um, I was given a piece and forced to taste it. And um, I know there are cultural sweet horse meat, but I can tell you, uh, even though I was starving, I just could it had this, maybe because it was rotten or something, I don't know, but it had this kind of sweet, yucky, awful taste. So, anyhow, I didn't eat a horseman. Yeah, but I'm still here, yeah. After the Russians entered the city, of course, there was fierce street, hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the streets, and then 
then suddenly liberation. But tell us what happened uh, as, you, as you were on the verge of liberation. Well, this is what I remember. Uh, I mentioned to you how crowded it was um, in the building. So, and most people, because of this constant uh, fighting and bombardment and constant deadly danger, um, piled up in the cellar, those who could fit in. Uh, but the condition of the cellar was totally, uh, totally, it was like the inferno, you know? Not only was it dark and cold, but uh, people were crying, they were sick, some of them died, and they were still there. It was just the hygiene, uh, like uh, lower deaths, if yep. uh, anybody read Dostoyevsky. Uh, so I couldn't tolerate that. Um, so it, it seemed, uh, and I wasn't alone. Uh, my father was the same way, and, and many of my family members. Um, so I figured that hitting, being hit by a gunfire or bomb was uh, preferable to being stuck down there. So I, we were up on a second floor apartment when we heard this loud cheering from the adjacent apartment building, and uh, trust me, there, you don't, you didn't hear too much laughter in those days. So that was something extremely unusual, and certainly not cheering. And then the word was spread that uh, the Germans are gone, or the Nazis are gone, and the Russians are here. At that point, we, this. Well, they saved our lives, I shouldn't say anything bad, but the constitution of uh, the army that came to liberate us was very... Uh, okay, we'll talk about that later. Okay. Uh, the point is that uh, we said we are liberated, actually we survived, at least uh, survived uh, the Nazis. And so we started uh, jumping up and down, dancing, hugging each other. And um, it didn't last long because suddenly everything went dark. There was a big bang and kind of red uh, thingies were crisscrossing the room. And it turned out that a fleeing a soldier, I assume it was a Nazi soldier, uh, or Aeroco soldier threw a grenade, grenade into the house and it happened to land in, uh, in the room. So, um, I dove under the uh, piano. I don't know how I knew to do that. Well, maybe I saw newsreels, I don't know. Um, and um, I wasn't wounded, um, but my father was severely wounded. Uh, my uncle and aunt was wounded. My grandfather wasn't, and I thought it odd. I was the youngest, he was the oldest. So the two of us escaped, unscathed at least uh, physically. Um, and um, so liberation turned into terror, at least for a while. And your father was quite seriously hurt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and he was crippled for the rest of his rest life. Of and his we didn't know whether he would survive. In, in, in the little time that we have left, I know there's several other things you want to talk to us about, but you, as you said to me, we served the, survived the Nazis, but the war was continuing. What do we do next? So what did you do next? <laughs> uh, what could you do next? Yeah. Um, so eventually, when uh, the street fighting stopped completely, um, uh, all of us kind of uh, picked up our whatever we had and tried to find a way to be. Um, my, uh, one of my aunts, uh, one of my uncles married a wonderful Catholic girl um, who survived in uh, her apartment. Uh, in their apartment. So we, uh, she contacted us, came over, at risking her life, really, and said, you know, all of you come over. I mean, half of the apartment is gone, and it was literally gone, uh, sheared off by bombs. But we still have enough room, certainly more room than you have here. So we um, walked across town, which was quite traumatic, you know, again, stepping over the dead, uh, 
and seeing everything that you saw was demolished, the city that you knew, gone. The bridge was all gone. Um, but that's what we did. And they started rebuilding. And what do you do? What do people do now in Syria and elsewhere? They try to survive and to, uh, to rebuild. <sighs> yeah. And after a while, your father was able to re get out of the hospital. Yeah, after a couple of months. A yeah. couple of months. And that's when you, you tried then to start to rebuild a life as best you could. Your father, I think, was able to get back his business a little bit. And well, he, he um, yeah, I wouldn't say business. Um, he started fixing teeth again, mm -hmm. and he started making, uh, I don't know, making teeth too again. Right. And then over the next 10 years, he, he built up his laboratory and, because there was great need for right. it. Yeah. And I, I wish we had another couple hours for you to talk about what happened from that point forward. But if I can just summarize it, because I want to get to a question of you, um, you lived under the communists um, after the war. Um, you found yourself in, in hot water with the communists, had an effect on you. By 1956, that's when you escaped from yeah. Hungary. Tell us a little bit about your escape. Okay, I'll be very brief because okay. uh, time is up. Uh, many people left after the war uh, who had relatives uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, but we didn't, uh, and um, we stayed. And for about four years, between 1945 and 49, there was hope that Hungary will be a democratic, free country and uh, life would be good. Um, so, so we stayed, of course. But in 1949, uh, the Stalinist regime became, uh, took over. Uh, there was a government takeover. At, uh, well, they followed the Bolshevik uh, cookbook. And then it, there was a second wave of persecution, um, which uh, didn't single out Jews, it singled out anybody who wasn't communist or, or was thinking freely or wanted to re live the way they wanted to live or read what they wanted to live. Anyhow, so things became very, very bad. I hated it. I wanted to be free. Uh, I thought that that's what we survived for. Uh, I was also somewhat persecuted, uh, not physically, but thrown out of universities, but from all the other universities in the country, even though I had very high grade point average. Um, and um, I really had it. I did not want to bring up my children in that country anymore. Uh, much as I loved it, Hungary is actually, the culture is really, really wonderful. Uh, so in 1956, when the revolution began, uh, there was a window of opportunity, although perilous, and um, uh, we escaped uh, through the mountains. Uh, we were refugees uh, in a refugee camp in Austria and um, eventually wound up in England where I had cousins, mm -hmm. the children of gone early. uncle, yeah. And um, we were there for about two years, uh, lots of adventures, mm -hmm. uh, starting from scratch. I mean, when we escaped, we escaped, I can't say that we even had our clothes on because by the time you hike the six or eight hours through wilderness and, uh, uh, the foothills of the Alps, which are mountain, uh, you get kind of torn, so you don't have much. So the only thing we had was what the various refugee organizations handed down, mm -hmm. and, and we started from, from scratch. So we arrived to uh, the United States in 1958, where my husband then, um, who was an engineer, was over the quota. We had a quota system. You guys had a quota system then, too. Uh, which was actually very strictly observed. So, but it was a Sputnik area, and um, so we were allowed to come to the States, and the rest is history. The rest is history. I, I, if you don't mind, I just have to comment on the fact that you were banned for essentially life in Hungary from going to university, 
and you came here <laughs> and achieved so yeah. much academically. Yeah. I, I just I just love that. I tell you, if you have the freedom to to learn, uh, take advantage of it. Yeah. Um, we um. We don't have time for questions today. There's just so much that we needed to hear from Susan about. But when Susan is finished, I want you to stay with us because Susan will speak to us again very, very briefly. When she's done, we'd like uh, to invite any of you who are interested or can come up on the stage right up here, meet Susan, uh, shake her hand, get your picture taken with her, or ask her a question. We, we absolutely welcome that. Um, I want to thank all of you for being with us. I'll remind you that we'll have first-person programs each Wednesday and Thursday through the middle of August. We hope you can come back, but if not, all of our programs are on the museum's YouTube page, so you can, you can view all of our programs. Um, when I turn back to Susan when she finishes, um, our photographer, Joel, is going to come up on stage and he's gonna take a photograph of Susan with you as the background. So we want you to stay put uh, for, that, uh, for that great photograph that we're about to get. It's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. So I'm going to turn back to Susan to close our program. Well, uh, I spoke enough. So uh, let me be, uh, thank you for listening to this, listening to my story. Um, I feel honored by that. And uh, what I would like to finish with is a quote from Anne Frank, um, who you know, didn't survive in the end, but he kept a diary, she kept a diary. And I was deeply moved when I came upon this quote, and I'm going to act, not paraphrase it, but actually read it to you. Um, being shut up in that attic and facing death and starvation all the time, this 13, 14, 15, 14 year old uh, child, and maybe that's why I really identified with this her so much, very close to my age, said, how wonderful it is that nobody need to wait for a single moment before starting to improve the world. So please do, please do. Thank you.